Hello and uh, welcome to Behind the Headlines. Uh, today's programme is a pre-recorded programme that will go out on the evening of Wednesday the 29th of September. For your information, we're recording this a day earlier. And in this programme, we'll be discussing a remarkable news event that you probably haven't noticed in your newspapers, you probably haven't seen it on your TV news reports, but this is how a gathering of 300 prominent Iraqis, uh, uh, Sunni, clerics, uh, Shiite clerics, uh, ex-military uh, generals and uh, politicians and journalists and leaders of NGOs met together in our bill in northern Iraq. And you'd be asking, why did they all meet together? For one reason, because they called upon the Iraqi government to make peace with Israel, um, to establish uh, normalization with Israel, to sign the Abraham Accords, and also to recompense the, the uh, Jewish uh, residents of Iraq that were forced to flee their homes in the 1950s and wanting to bring a new future to the state of Iraq. And we're asking, could this be in fulfillment of Isaiah 19 that talks about how the Lord will build a highway from Assyria to Egypt. Uh, Reagan, it's great to be joining you. Sadly, we're not live tonight, but I think our viewers will be very interested in this topic. Um, sometimes we're told that sometimes our, our, our topics we discuss and the subjects we choose are a little bit more depressing, but this one <laughs> is uh, kind of very upbeat because this yeah. is absolutely extraordinary that 300 prominent Iraqis have gathered together in our bill, which is in northern Iraq, in Kurdistan, calling for normalizations and peace with Israel. And this is calling for genuine peace with Israel in a nation that has been in a constant state of perpetual war with Israel since Israel's re-established in the 14th of May, 1948. Absolutely. Now, um, on, on my part anyway, I'm going to dedicate this side of the program to uh, my, my wife, who is Israeli, Rachel, who has told me, um, can't you guys do a positive story sometime? I'm like, well, come on, we, we, we give some hope. We, we tell people about the hope that's in Christ. But I mean, you know, this is an amazingly positive story. So, Rachel, if you're watching this positive story as requested. Um, Iraq, it would be amazing if Iraq makes peace with Israel. I've um, spent time in Israel and Iraq. My father-in-law regularly went to Iraq and regularly went in um, uh, into Erbil. Uh, I know people who are uh, part of the, um, the, the chief family of the Harki tribe of the Kurds in uh, our, our bill. So I'm, go I'm definitely going to be asking them a little bit about um, what's going on if they were a part of this summit as it included tribal chief leaders. Uh, one of the things that anyone who's surprised by this or who might think, oh, that, that's a bit of an odd story. We, we didn't see that coming. Actually, r remember that there were Jews throughout the entire Middle East. Um, th there were, there was at one time normal relations between um, the newly founded state of Israel and um, the, the Jews were uh, f across Iraq. There were Jews in Iran uh, and there were some friendly, decent relationships. But I think the big, the big question, when we're looking at the ancient Jewish community mm. in Iraq, that this is a community uh, that has been living and thriving in Iraq ever since Nebuchadnezzar yeah. ransacked Jerusalem uh, and then took away the Jewish elites to Babylon. And there has been a Jewish presence in that area of the world ever since really up until really 1948. I don't know how many Jewish people are left now, in Iraq, but considering everything yeah. that's gone on in Iraq, I think very, very few. Very so few we're also seeing that a lot of these um, Iraqi leaders and intellectuals are kind of mourning the, the loss of their Jewish heritage, mm. uh, which is also extraordinary. But if we look at what, what's happened, if we have a look at what's happened in Iraq over the last few years, I mean, we, we've seen that Northern Iraq was uh, dominated by the genocidal terrorist organization that's known as ISIS that committed acts of genocide against the Iraqi Christian community, uh, including the Yazidis and, and other minority groups. Um, and we also saw, for example, that the, the nation was turned into an insurgency uh, after uh, the US-led um, invasion to remove Saddam Hussein from power and, and the Ba'athists in 2003, uh, where the, the, the country was in engulfed in almost 
uh, daily suicide bombings, yep. civil war. And so to come out of a nation where these people are calling for peace with Israel is extraordinary. Yeah. And also the, the other fact is when it comes to looking at this issue of Iraq, there are two nations that, that are mentioned the most in the Bible. The first is Israel and then the other is Babylon or Iraq. Yeah. So it plays a major role in kind of Bible prophecy as well. I have had many Kurdish friends, and of course, um, Kurdistan is, um, you know, there's it's disputed territory there in northern Iraq and uh, southern Turkey, Erbil being the capital of Kurdistan. But um, my Kurdish friends really maximize the biblical nature of um, the, the Kurdish people and, and how so much that we see, especially early on in the scriptures, uh, has a, a really big rooting in modern day Iraq. Uh, if you consider the Tower of Babel, modern day Iraq, you consider um, a, a lot of the, well, the first kingdom that we see under Nimrod, modern day Iraq. Um, you, you consider. Garden of Eden? Yeah, exactly. Modern day Iraq between Tigris and Euphrates. You, you, you can l look across even, um, I, I believe, Abram as well, modern day Iraq. A lot of the, the early biblical heroes, modern day Iraq. So um, uh, it has a very key place in biblical history uh, to see how things um, d dilapidated uh, after the 1930s that there was uh, th there was an individual who uh, w went on to lead the Mossad um, his name was uh, Reuven Shilawa and he uh, he actually explored the region in North Iraq prior to the um, institution of the State of Israel in 1931 with the deliberate aim of forging contacts and developing areas and I ideas on Israeli relations, um, uh, what, what believed would be Israeli relations with non-Arab um, groupings. Hence uh, an immense friendship that has endured between Israel and the Kurds over um, over decades, uh, where Israel has supported um, the Kurdish um, uh, idea of independence from Iraq as a state, and has supported Kurdistan that way. And the Kurds have also been similarly friendly with Israel. Um, but what we're talking about here goes beyond just uh, Kurdistan and the Kurds. Though the, the conference w which we're talking about uh, happened in Erbil, the capital of. Kurdistan, it actually has a ripple effect and is extending throughout the entirety of Iraq with different key leaders taking part in this saying Iraq needs to normalize relations with um, Israel. Uh, yes, Baghdad, uh, various individuals in high places have said, oh no, we, we don't think this is representative of the population as a whole. When I was in Iraq and talking with various uh, individuals there, um, I did not come across any negative opinion concerning Israel. My, my father-in-law, who was there freely and had been going for um, for some years, what, um, he, he was Israeli. They knew that. No issues. Um, how many places could you say that that would be experienced in the case in the Middle East today? Not oh, that's many. extraordinary. And also, I think you know this could see the uh, fulfillment of Isaiah 19. So from Isaiah 19 verses 23 to 25, uh, and this is what the old book says. It says, in that day there shall be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And of course, Assyria is modern day Iraq, northern mm. Iraq. And the Assyrians will come into Egypt and the Egyptians into Assyria. And the Egyptians will serve with the, uh, with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be one of three with Egypt and Assyria in a blessing in the midst of the land whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, says, uh, says the Lord. Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. So, you know, and considering that the uh, new Israeli prime minister as well, um, Naftali Bennett recently was on an official visit to, to Cairo mm -hmm. uh, to meet uh, the, the, the president, uh, Sisi, there, also talks about the developing, flourishing relationship between Egypt and Israel. And potentially here we also have uh, Assyria, also known as northern Iraq, wanting to make peace with Israel, normalizations with Israel. I mean, this is pretty much unheard of, um, yeah. essentially because the Middle East before, uh, when Egypt signed the uh, Camp David Accords in 1979, that Israel then gave up the Sinai 
um, in return for peace. There was a genuine move towards peace between President Assad, Assad of Egypt and uh, Michin Begin. Uh, and Assad even travelled to the Israeli Knesset, the parliament, to address the parliament to say, now is the time to have peace. He went out of his way to, to actually woo the Israelis, as it were, who were very sceptical of the need for peace because he believed this was in uh, Egypt's strategic uh, interest. We saw a uh, normalisation and cultural ties between the two countries up until his assassination, I believe, by the Muslim Brotherhood in 81, and then we saw Mubarak take power. Then we saw a cold peace develop. And Israel's warmest peace that it has is with, with Jordan, but that's cold because it's mm. all very much dependent upon what's happening with the Palestinians, considering that Jordanian has 70% of its population or more as, uh, as, as Palestinians, so therefore that has a direct relationship on the way that Jordan views Israel. Uh, but of course we saw that the Abraham Accords that were signed between the United Arab Emirates and uh, Bahrain in um, September of 2020 last year, um, I thought was actually dying in terms of uh, the new uh, Biden administration coming into power. Uh, completely neglecting the uh, the Abraham Accords. Uh, and now we see that Iraq, these Iraqi leaders are calling for their nation to normalize relations with Israel. And then considering that it actually was a criminal offense until 2010, punishable by death, if you were seen to be a Zionist or you were collaborating or even talking with Israelis. I think that's now a life sentence. So we're seeing fundamental grassroots changes, particularly in Iraq, which, which is absolutely incredible. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, you can, we, we talked about the early biblical um, t time period and the uh, stories that we see, especially in Genesis, that are uh, related to um, the Jews in Iraq. But uh, the relationship, you can say, uh, wasn't always great. Uh, Assyria, which you already mentioned, um, destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BC. And many Jews were taken to um, Assyria, which is northern Iraq today. Uh, of course, we see in the New Testament the individuals known as Samaritans. They were the product of intermarriage between Assyrians and Jews in the northern kingdom. And as a result of that and some religious syncretism, they began um, to be hated. Uh, there was also a very large Jewish community established in Babylon, which is also modern day Iraq, in 586 BC when Nebuchadnezzar ransacked Jerusalem and took the Jewish elites as captives to Babylon. So you can consider the stories of um, uh, Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, they were given those names. Uh, and y you, can, you can apply that and link that and recognize, okay, th th these, these individuals, that they were familiar with the territory. They were familiar with uh, Iraq. And what's interesting is also in the, in the prophets, well, you can look at the experience of exile as very negative. You can look at um, the curse and you can look at the, um, the punishment uh, that God wrecked upon uh, both the northern and the southern kingdom, Israel and the north and Judah and the south, um, as uh, God's judgment against their idolatry, there was still positive relationship out of that that was encouraged. So uh, the, the prophet said to seek the good of the city that God has you in. And we see Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael do exactly that in their faithful service, both of God um, in their uh, their day-to-day -day life, even when it was challenging, but also in their faithful service of the, the empire of which they found themselves in. Uh, centuries later, the region would welcome its Jewish community that produced some of the um, uh, m most prominent rabbinical uh, stuff producing the B Babylonian Talmud between 500 and 700 AD. And that, of course, is um, still a document that is very critical to modern, modern rabbinical Jewish thought. Absolutely. I, I just want to go back as well. I mean, not only were, for example, Daniel, um, Nehemiah and others, but particularly when Daniel, he, when Nebuchadnezzar went mad, uh, and started eating the grass, yeah. it was actually Daniel and his friends that were actually ruling Babylon, the entire pagan empire. So we have Jewish people that God had raised up 
to actually rule over pagan empires such as Babylon. But we also see that, uh, for example, we go uh, to back to the First World War in uh, 1914, um, that one third of Baghdad's population was actually Jewish. Incredible. And in 1922, uh, the British were given the mandate by the League of Nations together with the Mandate of Palestine. Uh, they began to transform Iraq into a modern state. In 1932, Iraq became independent and the government relied heavily on its well-educated Jewish population. Uh, Iraq's first um, finance minister was Jewish. Uh, the community played a vital role in developing judicial and uh, the postal service in Iraq. And then uh, at the end of the British mandate, the 2,700-year-old Jewish Iraqi community suffered horrendous uh, persecution, particularly because of the uh, Zionists wanting to re-establish the modern state of Israel. And uh, sadly, a, a sad chapter in, in, uh, in Jewish history in Iraq occurred in June of 1941, mm. known as the Farhud. Uh, and this is where the uh, Mufti-inspired pro-Nazi coup of uh, Rashid Ali uh, sparked rioting and a pogrom in Baghdad during the uh, Jewish feast of Shavuot. Uh, armed Iraqi mobs uh, with the, the complicity of the police and the army murdered 180 Jewish people and wounded almost 1,000 in what became known as the Fahud program. Um, and then of course we see then that immediately the British restored order and uh, again, the Jewish community was there able to flourish for a few years. Yeah, it's um, in 19, uh, early 1940s, as there was this big drive for in the state of Israel and its founding, we see that while this massacre was happening in Baghdad, the relationship um, between the Jews and uh, the Kurds was still uh, quite positive. And interestingly, I mean, this just shows how times change. Um, they were allowed safe passage through Kurdistan um, and then uh, a core part, a core party that was helping the Jews escape Iraq through Kurdistan it was not only the Kurds, but also Iran, you know, w which is essentially Israel's primary number one enemy at this point in time. So uh, in uh, the not this point in time, uh, yeah, this exact point moment in yeah. time, yes, but obviously at under the, the Shah and under at that Putin's time it was at peace. Yeah, yeah, yeah at that time, time, at that time they had but great relations. Time. Yeah, and, and there were many Jews, just as there were in Iraq. There were so many Jews in Iran as well. But also, let, let's uh, also note uh, what uh, the Jewish people of Iraq actually built in Iraq. So they actually built a network of medical facilities, uh, schools, cultural activities and nearly all the members of Baghdad's Sympathy Orchestra were Jewish, uh, yet this flourishing environment abruptly ended in 1947 uh, with the uh, partition of Palestine and Israel's fight for independence, outbreaks of anti-Jewish rioting uh, regularly occurred between 1948 and 1949 after the establishment of Israel in 1948 and then this is where we saw the mass expulsion of the Jewish people from Iraq. And uh, we have this excellent CBN news report to go to on this very issue. This story begins almost 3,000 years ago in Iraq. That's when the Bible tells how the Jewish people were exiled to Babylon, located some 60 miles from modern day Baghdad. After the exile ended, many descendants stayed there for generations until the state of Israel was established in 1948. One thing my mom told me, she said, when you leave Baghdad, never talk about the stuff that happened. Don't talk about it at all. She said, nobody wants to hear morbid stories because whatever happened was morbid. I told her, but why? I want everybody to know what we've been through if we survive, if we get out. Filmmakers Carol Basri and Adriana Davis agreed the story needed to be told. Their documentary, Saving the Iraqi Jewish Archives, A Journey of Identity, tells how this Jewish community faced its own forced exodus from Iraq after more than 2,500 years. It sheds new light on the history of this community, the struggle to save the evidence of its existence, and the fight to keep the story alive. I've learned that it's a much bigger issue than just things from the Iraqi Jews. It's also about 
the cultural and religious heritage of all ethnically cleansed people in the Middle East. The archives to me became the sort of physical embodiment of the way the community was um, legally disseminated because there was a legal precedent that detailed the laws that forced the Jewish community out. If you can't work and you can't go to school and you can't even hold money in the bank, you can't hold property, how are you to stay? Due to this growing persecution, more than 160,000 Iraqi Jews began fleeing their homeland in 1952. Over the following decades, Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi government continued to punish the community by stripping property, seizing religious and cultural items, and purging personal records, including photographs. I don't know if people understand that when the Iraqi Jews left their homeland of 2,700 years since the first temple, we were not allowed legally to take anything out of the country except three sets of clothes and 50 dinars and you could take your wedding ring, that's it. I'm trying to go abroad uh, to continue my graduate studies and so on and uh, word came back to show up at the headquarters of the internal security. Uh, they ushered me into a room where uh, they were taking somebody out who was already being interrogated and, uh, you know, his all blood on his head and so on. It was a little bit of a frightening experience. Fast forward to 2003, when during the Iraq war, the U.S. bombed the Muqabarat secret police headquarters in Baghdad. Explosions ruptured the water system and flooded the basement. Based on an intelligence tip, Harold Rode, an Orthodox Jew working for the Pentagon, and others entered the building and found the collection of Jewish belongings underwater. With U.S. military help, they rescued nearly 20,000 personal and religious artifacts confiscated from the Jewish community, some hundreds of years old. This whole project is a project of miracles. Hashem, God put me there. As far as I'm concerned, I was there to be there to help make this project work. Items included Torah scrolls and prayer books, as well as documents of the Frank Eni School, the last Jewish school in Iraq. It closed in 1972, and its founder, Frank Eni, was Basri's grandfather. The school that my grandfather founded was founded because of the Farhud, which was the pro-Nazi uprising in Iraq in 1941. Well, there was no Israel then. The damaged artifacts were shipped to the National Archives in Washington for restoration. In watching how that community left, to have miraculously found all this material, religious, cultural, personal material, to find all those items was to me the actual physical embodiment of the spirit of the Iraqi Jewish community. The U.S. government's initial agreement indicated it would return the archives to Iraq, where there are just a handful of Jews left today. The State Department is trying to work out a new deal whereby the archives would stay in the U.S. The Jewish community is concerned that if it's returned, it will only be neglected or worse, destroyed. And they say the items belong to them anyway. Iraq argues it wants to put the items on display as part of the country's national heritage. I believe that the Iraqi Jewish story is an important story to tell, and it can only be told with the artifacts, the cultural and religious artifacts that are part of the Iraqi Jewish archives. The filmmakers see the driving out of the Jews as the same kind of ethnic cleansing from which so many Christians in the Middle East have suffered during the last decade. I believe that that is a universal story. It's not a, a Jewish story to someone from not that background uh, by birth. I understand the parallels to early Christians or, you know, even what's going on now. We just heard about it in the news uh, when the Pope visited. Davis says they need another miracle in order to keep the archives in the U.S. safe and accessible to tell the Iraqi Jewish story to generations to come. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Excellent uh, report there by, by CBN and uh, really nice to see my friend uh, Dr. Harold uh, Rode there actually 
uh, taking that very dangerous risk of going to Iraq and actually bringing back these ancient uh, Jewish archives uh, that go, date back hundreds of years, which is so important to the um, Iraqi Jewish community because they hold their cultural roots so strongly. Um, but if we look at that period of time uh, with the expulsion of the Jews from uh, Iraq, it was quite horrific. So we see that after 1948, uh, Iraq began persecuting uh, those Jews who remained. The government made Zionism a criminal offence, began firing Iraqi Jews from the civil service en masse, and other Iraqi Jews were arrested and executed as suspected spies. And then between 1950 and 1952, over 100,000 Iraqi Jews uh, emigrated to Israel as part of Operation Ezra, and Operation Nehemiah, uh, driven to emigrate by further decades of repression, war, and only now a handful of Jewish people remain. And in 1950, the Iraqi Jews were permitted to leave the country within a year, provided they forfeited their citizenship. A year later, however, the property of Jews who emigrated to Israel was frozen, and economic restrictions were placed on those Jews who remained in the country. And from 1949 to 1951, some 104,000 Jews were evacuated from Iraq, as I mentioned in Operation Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, named after the Jewish leaders who took their people back from, uh, to Jerusalem from exile in Babylon, beginning in 597 BC. Uh, and another 20,000 were smuggled out, of, uh, out through Iran. Uh, Incredible, incredible yeah. period of history. It's known as the forgotten refugees. And as such, it shouldn't come as any surprise as we see all of the tension that was part of that. Iraq has officially been at war with Israel, um, along with most of the other Arab nation states, since the Jewish state was founded in 1948. Iraqi soldiers have fought in three successive Arab wars against Israel. Saddam Hussein's secret nuclear weapons program uh, alarmed Israel, which ultimately destroyed the Osirak reactor in Iraq in 1981. And in 1991, the Iraqi dictator fired dozens of Scud missiles at Tel Aviv and Haifa to draw Israel into the Gulf War. Um, so we see there's, um, in regard to the uh, Iraqi state, there's been that active aggression uh, that's persisted against Israel and so that the idea uh, that there could be peace, that multiple leaders are calling for peace and, and they're not only um, from the, the Kurdistan region is incredibly encouraging. Yes, Baghdad has pushed against it. Yes, Baghdad is saying, no, we, we're still not keen on this. We're um, not wanting to do this, but pressure ultimately um, and hopefully will prevail. I mean, the big difference, I think, between the peace agreement signed by Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates last year was that uh, those two uh, Gulf states never took part in military action against Israel. And yet Iraqi soldiers took part mm. in three major wars against Israel. Israel's War of Independence, uh, the Six Day War in June 1967, where the Israelis actually took out the entire Iraqi Air Force, uh, and then again in the Yom Kippur War of 1973. And what one can uh, kind of understand from the Iraqi um, government's perspective, uh, from Baghdad's perspective, um, that Israel has been very friendly with Kurdistan, as we've already said. Indeed, Israel has aided the Peshmerga, a uh, group of Kurdish freedom fighters. Uh, they've even provided training for the Peshmerga um, that, that received some um, BBC news coverage in the early 2000s. It was roundly condemned by Israel. It presented a major security uh, concern. Israel has repeatedly promised unconditional support for independent Kurdistan. Um, so they're going, there's going to be, have to be some barriers that are overcome, but perhaps in making peace with Israel, at some point maybe um, the uh, independence of the Kurds will also be re recognized in the future. More than 300 fellow Iraqis from Baghdad, Mosul, Al Anbar, Babel, um, Salhuddin, and Dila joined um, on Friday in the northern city where uh, it was. Uh, an public demand was issued for Iraq to enter into relations with Israel and its people through the Abraham Accords. Extraordinary. And uh, to, uh, I was actually did a pre recorded interview uh, via Zoom with Chris, with Chris Mitchell, who is the CBN Bureau Chief in Jerusalem, to get his take 
on this extraordinary conference that took place in Arbil last Friday. We're now joined on behind headlines uh, by Chris Mitchell, the CBN's Bureau Chief in Jerusalem. Uh, Chris, warm welcome to Behind the Headlines. Great to be with you, Simon. Pleasure. Uh, and Chris, what do you make of this remarkable conference that's taken place in Iraq uh, last Friday, where over 300 prominent Iraqis, both Sunnis and Shias, and uh, a former Iraqi military men, as well as politicians, gathered together for a conference calling for peace with Israel, normalizations with Israel, and the restoration of the relationship between the Iraqi Jews and the Iraqi state. Well, Simon, it was remarkable. And I think it took a lot of people by surprise that something like this uh, would actually be there uh, in Erbil, in Iraq, uh, not too far from Iran as well. Uh, so 300 of these uh, prominent Sunni and as you said, Shiite uh, leaders came together and made this statement. It seems like an, a continuation of uh, this remarkable uh, Abraham Accords that started just over a year ago with uh, the UAE, Bahrain, uh, normalizing relations with Israel and now Sudan and Morocco. Uh, this is just uh, something a lot of people didn't expect. Uh, not too long ago in the former administration, uh, we interviewed then uh, U.S. Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, he said when he came into office, uh, they actually knew almost immediately that this was something they could pursue, and they did pursue it. Uh, so hopefully what's happening in Erbil will be a continuation uh, of what's happening in other parts of the Middle East. Uh, and Chris, only a few years ago, uh, you, you filmed some very brave and courageous uh, news reports out of northern Iraq at the time when the Islamic State was committing genocide against Christians and against Yazidis and just causing absolute havoc and terror in that region. So how surprising is it that in the aftermath of, uh, of ISIS, we're now seeing the emergence of a, a new Iraqi leadership that have the bravery and the courage to call for peace with Israel? Well, certainly a, a number of years ago when you saw people literally fleeing for their lives uh, many Syrians and Iraqis, uh, and many of believers in, the, in those people that were fleeing. In fact, I just talked earlier today with uh, a pastor from Erbil. He's now a refugee living in Canada, and uh, he was the one that actually translated for us and took us to many places uh, in Kurdistan and uh, when ISIS was ravaging uh, that part. So who would expect years later that we would see a meeting like this? I would add, Simon, that uh, the aftermath, aftermath of this meeting is that Iraqi leaders have condemned it, uh, and they feel like uh, this is, they're not officially endorsing it. So it's not going to be easy. It's a, it's a lot easier probably in the Gulf states, like the UAE and Bahrain, to go ahead and normalize relations. But when you have people that uh, have a government uh, in Iraq that is somewhat, that more than somewhat, that is really uh, influenced uh, in, in a great way by Iran, uh, that it's not going to be easy for them. But they felt it was important to make this statement. And, uh, and this many, uh, as I was told by uh, those I was talking to earlier, that uh, many of these Sunni uh, leaders felt it was important to make this statement. Uh, also, what's uh, surprising is that uh, they were allowed to have this conference, that they made this these incredible policy recommendations for the Iraqi government to uh, normalize relations with Israel, uh, knowing that Iraq has been a perpetual state of war uh, with Israel ever since uh, the formation of the modern state of Israel uh, on, in May 1948. Uh, and considering that any support for Zionism or any, um, any discussions or talks with Israelis will result in a, a death penalty on behalf of any Iraqis who, who do that. So these uh, leaders that, that took part are really showing incredible courage and bravery, aren't they? Um, and, and what do you think lies behind their desire to see this normalization of relations with Israel? Well, certainly uh, to ex uh, exhibit bravery is certainly what they did uh, last Friday. Uh, what's behind it? I, I think uh, it seems partly uh, a genuine uh, effort to sort of make amends and reconciliation. Uh, the history of the Jewish people uh, in Iraq after the formation of the Jewish state in 1948 is not a, not a good one. Uh, 
uh, not pretty at all. Many of the people had to flee for their lives. Uh, many Iraqi Jews that came here to Israel uh, left their property behind. It's one of the untold stories of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, most of the attention gets uh, in 1948 on uh, many Palestinians that left uh, this land during that war. Many were told by Arab leaders to flee, and then a few weeks later you could come back to your uh, properties. That didn't happen. And, uh, but many uh, Jews throughout the Middle East, after the formation uh, of, uh, of the Jewish state, uh, had to leave, whether it's Iraq or Iran uh, and uh, other Middle East uh, nations, uh, Syria, uh, they had to flee for their lives. That's the untold exodus uh, in, in the last few years. But partly, I think uh, they may see what's happening. These uh, normalization of relations with the UAE and Bahrain and others, uh, it's increased trade, tourism. Uh, these nations are taking advantage of the technology uh, that's developed here in Israel. So I think they would see it as a benefit to them uh, in the long run, despite the dangers by coming out so vocal and uh, about this situation. Uh, and Chris, can I just read you um, a comment made by the leader of this movement called uh, Wissam al Hardin, and he wrote an op-ed in the uh, Wall Street Journal um, entitled Iraq should join the Abraham Accords. And uh, this is what he said. He, he wrote this one. He said uh, that the expulsion of Iraq's Jews was the most infamous act in the country's decline and that Iraq must reconnect with the whole of our diaspora, including these Jews. What do you think uh, this message sends to what is known as the forgotten refugees who just mentioned, that 100,000 Iraqi Jews who've been living in Iraq since biblical times, certainly since Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem yeah. and took the Jewish exile to Babylon, have been living there that long. What do you think this will mean for them the Iraqi leaders are now recognizing the horrible um, treatment that Iraqi Jews faced and how they were expelled, expelled from Israel um, almost 70 years ago. Well, Simon, first of all, as you, you recall, this is uh, biblical. We're talking going back to the time of Daniel and the uh, Babylonian exile. Uh, so there's such a history between uh, modern day Iraq and, uh, and Israel. And uh, perhaps Simon, He's understanding what it says in Genesis 12, 2 and 3, that those that bless Israel will be blessed and those that uh, curse Israel will be cursed. Uh, you can look through nation after nation that has come against the Jewish people who would expel them. Uh, you know, sadly, uh, Great Britain has some uh, history in that. Spain has uh, history in that. Uh, so, you know, nation after nation throughout history, uh, when they bless the Jewish people, they are blessed when they do not. Uh, they're cursed and, and they suffer that. So perhaps he understand the biblical principle. Uh, we would hope so. And um, Chris, how has this uh, conference gone down with the Israeli government um, led by Neftali Bennett? Well, officially, uh, I haven't heard any comment yet. And actually, I wouldn't expect to. Uh, sometimes when Israel comes out publicly in support of uh, a, a, a conference like this, uh, it can actually make it harder on those people that come out uh, in a stand for, uh, for Israel. They, they may get uh, accused of being Zionists. They may get accused of being, you know, collaborators with uh, the Zionist enemy. So nothing official. I have to add that uh, Friday is Shabbat here, or the eve of Shabbat. Uh, right now we're on the eve of uh, the end of uh, Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. So uh, the government is not doing a lot of official functions right now. But uh, overall, I wouldn't expect to see something official coming out by the government. And in this um, new call for uh, normalizations uh, and uh, peace with Israel from these uh, prominent uh, Iraqi leaders, could we actually be seeing the fulfillment of, of biblical prophecy, particularly as it relates to Isaiah 19, 23 to 25, that says, in that day, there shall be a highway from Egypt to Assyria and the Assyrians will come into Egypt and the Egyptians into Assyria, uh, and the Egyptians will serve with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be one of three with Egypt and Assyria in a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Is Egypt my people, and Assyria the work of my hand, and Israel my inheritance? I think that's exactly, Simon, if you look behind the scenes, 
uh, you see this biblical principle, this uh, prophetic statement by the, uh, by the prophet Isaiah unfolding in our times. Uh, we see Naftali Bennett just visited uh, the president of, uh, of Egypt, El Sisi, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and, and yet, even though there's a lot of opposition, uh, it could be Turkey, Syria, uh, Iraq, Iran, uh, I think that uh, in exec, uh, how should I say it, that the, the prophecy is happening, it will happen, it will have a lot of opposition, I believe, uh, but I think that uh, this is happening in our time, uh, and, and we will see it eventually unfold, perhaps in uh, its, its fullness, in, uh, in the Millennium Kingdom when Jesus rules and reigns here, uh, but we are seeing it. There are many people praying for exactly this, that the, for the Isaiah 19 highway to be unfolded. I talked earlier today with somebody from uh, Erbil who uh, oversees a house of prayer. Uh, they're praying for the, this fulfillment. They're praying for it here in, uh, in Jerusalem. They're praying for it in, uh, in Egypt and as well as Turkey and throughout the Middle East. This is on the heart of many, many believers. And I would add, too, uh, that this prayer leader was telling me that many, many uh, people are coming to the Lord. Uh, there's a great hunger. He's never seen more uh, people coming to the Lord in his, his area than, than in the many years that he's been uh, uh, being a minister there uh, for the gospel. So in the midst of great darkness is also great light, sometimes from the believers and sometimes from brave uh, people like this, uh, this meeting last Friday. Fabulous. Uh, and, and finally, Chris, um, I know that you're in the hot seat in, in Jerusalem, but how can our viewers be praying for, for Israel at this time? Great question. I think, uh, first of all, for COVID, I think it's on the minds of so many people here. Uh, it is probably the most vaccinated nation uh, on earth per capita, and yet still they're fighting uh, the COVID, this uh, third wave of the Delta variant. Uh, so I would pray that the, uh, the COVID would be mitigated, that people could come here once again. There are so many people around the world that have a hunger to come back to Israel. It's been uh, almost two years now when people have not been able to come here. I would pray for that. Uh, pray for uh, the peace of Jerusalem, obviously, and, and in that light, pray for protection uh, against Iran, who's getting closer and closer and closer. Uh, to have enough enriched uranium to make a nuclear device. Uh, combine that with their desire to wipe Israel off the map. That's the existential threat that Israel is, uh, is facing. Pray for its leaders, Naftali Bennett and uh, all his cabinet to have great wisdom during this time. And, uh, and that uh, we, you can pray for the Lord to come back because he's coming back <laughs> here to Jerusalem. Uh, amen, amen to that. Uh, Chris, I want to thank you so much for joining us on, on Behind the Headlines. Keep up the excellent work you're doing through uh, Jerusalem Dateline, which you can watch on Revelation TV. And uh, it's great that you can join us today. Great to be with you, Simon. Pleasure. Well, thank you to Chris Mitchell and Simon for that very enlightening interview. I want to read from an editorial in the Wall Street Journal. Um, this is written by Wasad al-Hadin. Uh, he says, We are an assembly of Sunnis and Shiites uh, featuring members of the Sunni Sons of Iraq Awakening Movement, which I lead in addition to intellectuals, tribal elders, and youth activists of the 2019 to 2021 protest movement. Some of us have faced down ISIS and Al-Qaeda on the battlefield. Through blood and tears, we have long demonstrated that we oppose all extremists, whether Sunni jihadists or Iran-backed Shia militias. We have also demonstrated our patriotism. We sacrifice lives for the sake of a unified Iraq, aspiring to realize a federal system of government as stipulated in our nation's constitution. The most infamous act in this tragedy was the mass exodus and dispossession of the majority of our Iraqi Jewish population, a community with 2,600 years of history in the mid-20th century. Through their forced migration, Iraq effectively cut one of its own principal veins. Yet we draw hope from the knowledge that most Iraqi Jews managed to rebuild their lives, passing their traditions to their children and grandchildren in Israel. In striving to rebuild Iraq, we must reconnect with the whole of our diaspora, including these Jews, 
We reject the hypocrisy in some quarters of Iraq that speaks kindly of Iraqi Jews while denigrating their Israeli citizenship and the Jewish state which granted them asylum. Some of the countries surrounding Iraq are withering in war, while others are blooming in peace. We reject the rule by warlords that has devastated Libya and Yemen. We refuse to allow the tyranny and atrocities of Syria to dissuade us. We decry the cascading tragedies of Lebanon, where a militia that began as a state within a state has swallowed the country whole. At the same time, we see a hopeful trend in the region, an expanding community of peace, economic development, and brotherhood that is the framework of the Abraham Accords, initiated by the United Arab Emirates with its Israeli partners and joined by our brethren from Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco. We have a choice, tyranny and chaos, or legality, decency, peace, and progress. The answer is clear. Just as we demand that Iraq achieve federalism domestically, we demand that Iraq join the Abraham Accords internationally. We call for full diplomatic relations with Israel and a new policy of mutual development and prosperity. Incredible. Absolutely extraordinary, isn't it? And this is coming out of Iraq. Uh, and let's understand that Iraq is, is not a democracy. Uh, it, it's pretty much still an authoritarian kind of regime, but we know that the power shifted away mm. from the Sunnis to the, to, to the Shiites. And, uh, you know, if you said something like this under the era of Saddam Hussein, uh, you, you, this is public execution, uh, this is treachery, this is, this is betraying the nation, um, uh, you know. Uh, and so to see this uh, group of brave and courageous Iraqis, not just one, two or three, we're talking about 300 prominent Iraqi figures and leaders right across from, from the military uh, to former ministers to journalists to heads of NGOs to different religious factions whether they're Sunni or they're Shia clerics calling for peace and normalization with Israel um, it's just extraordinary but it's also a recognition I think as well spiritually that they recognize that the only stable state in the entire Middle East is mm -hmm. the state of Israel uh, and why is that because God has planted in, them in that land and they cannot be moved and there's also, we, we see that this is also happening primarily because we see that America has, has withdrawn from the Middle East. And they're seeing the, the, rise of, uh, seeing the rise of ISIS. They're seeing that Iran is on the verge of acquiring nuclear weapons and dominating the region. They see the likes of Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, the, the jihadi terrorists, and how this brings nothing but destruction. And so therefore they're looking at this thinking, the only answer for peace, stability, economic prosperity is if we make peace with Israel. Um, and it just shows how extraordinary the times that we're living in, that they have come to that conclusion themselves. And it's almost as if God is creating the, the infrastructure and the means to start to fulfill Isaiah 19, mm. uh, and that highway between Assyria and, and Egypt that we read about in, in the book of Isaiah. Well, I think it's very helpful for viewers to recognize, I, I've come across this idea and that there's been worry, of course, because of the United States and um, the Biden administration, its um, relative lack of support for Israel. And you, you, you consider over the years the good relationship the U.S. has had with Israel and I, I think a lot of times people have felt Israel can't survive without the United States. Israel can't survive without the U.S. support. Israel can't progress if, um, if the U.S. is in any way, shape, form or fashion against it. The U.S. isn't God, right? Um, Joe Biden, no president, it doesn't matter who, who is in the role. They're not God. God's promises will be fulfilled whether the U.S. is involved or not. And we're seeing how, um, despite this withdrawal of um, the U.S. and um, the, the Biden administration from r really great vocal support of Israel, Israel is standing, I won't say on its own two feet, it's standing because the Lord is allowing it to stand. And it's progressing because the Lord is allowing it to progress as He works out all things toward the fullness of time, to the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Israel doesn't need the U.S. Israel only needs God, and God has given His promises, which are, um, you know, th th they they will not be retracted. His covenant cannot be revoked. So, and uh, as we already discussed in Isaiah 19, verse 23 through 25, I mean, this this looks really clear to me. I, 
it looks pretty blatant. In that day, there shall be a highway from Egypt, which Israel is having really good relationship with at the moment, to Assyria. Assyria, which we've already discussed, is, um, was predominantly located there in northern Iraq. And the Assyrians will come into Egypt and the Egyptians into Assyria. And the Egyptians will serve with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be one of three with Egypt and Assyria in a blessing in the midst of the land whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed is Egypt my people and Assyria the work of my hands and Israel my inheritance. Phenomenal. I, and you, you have to look at this situation and say, is God bringing this about? Is God bringing it to pass? Well, I also think that the, the fact is that those gathered at this uh, conference last Friday are uh, in a bill are the intelligentsia of Iraq. Mm. They're the ones with the ideas. They're the ones saying that we've got to do this for the sake of Iraq and saying that if we don't normalize relations with Israel, Iraq as a nation doesn't have a future. We want our, our, our country to prosper. Uh, we want to be at peace. Um, we want stability in our region because there's too much conflict. The only answer to that is actually making peace with Israel, not a cold peace. This is calling for normalizations mm. uh, with Israel. This is having the same strategic relationship that the United States has with Israel or that Britain has with Israel. But also the other uh, element that we have to discuss as well, that within Arab culture in particular, they need, always need a backer or a protector. And since the Americans, um, and it really started with President Obama, have withdrew from the region, um, these, uh, these, these Sunni and uh, Shiite intellectuals are realizing they don't want to be controlled, manipulated by the Iranians who are effectively controlling the Iraqi government. Uh, they don't want to be under the influence of Iran. They don't want to be under Sharia law. They don't want to be under a kind of terrorist entity in the Middle East, be it uh, Hezbollah, be it Hamas, be it ISIS, but they want to be a genuine democracy with the institutions of democracy. And the only way they can achieve that, they know, is by having a strong relationship with Israel. And this is organic. Mm. This, this has come from the grassroots. This hasn't come from top down. Um, and this could bring about a, a complete change in the Middle East, it's just extraordinary. Consider the promises God made to Abram, who he called out of that region uh, in modern day Iraq. He said, I'm going to show you a land and I'll give you descendants and um, through your offspring, I, I, I will bless you. I'll bless you with offspring and I'll bless you and make you a blessing to all the nations of the earth. And of course, we see that Jesus Christ is um, the ultimate blessing that comes um, from, from the offspring of Abraham to all the nations. Yet at the same time, we, we cannot ignore and underestimate the on, ongoing um, reality of the national side of the covenant promises of God, uh, where repeatedly and the offspring of Abraham, the children of Israel, are told that they will be a blessing. Through them there will be a blessing unto all nations. Those who uh, love them, those who bless them will be blessed. Those who, uh, th those who curse them will be cursed. And we see that right across the world. We see it particularly in the Middle East. Absolutely. No one can look at, and, and you know, our friend from the Wall Street Journal editorial there recognizes it. No one can look at the Middle East and see stability apart from um, to, to a great degree in Israel. Uh, Reagan, uh, great to do a uh, program and a, a good news story that fits into Bible prophecy. Don't quite know where this uh, story fits into uh, Bible prophecy, but we know that this could potentially mm. fulfill the uh, prophecy in Isaiah 19. Will this come about before the Ezekiel 38 or 39 war. Uh, we can only speculate and, and see as events on hold. But what this does mark is potentially a new chapter in relations between Israel and Iraq that have been uh, sworn enemies ever since Israel was reestablished as a state in 1948. And it just shows us that we are living in exciting times. We're living in biblical times. We're living in a time when God's word is being fulfilled in our day. So this only points to one thing, the return of Yeshua HaMashiach. So let's have our lamps ready. ready. Let's get ready for his return. I wanna thank you for watching Behind Headlines. <laughs>